families torn apart by our borders, by our prisons, will an uprising of outrage about the Trump administration's immigration policy cause the nation to think more deeply about our incarceration system, too? Imani Davis, who's been through it personally, and Color of Change's Rashad Robinson join me in studio for that conversation. Then a short film on the cash bail system by Molly Crabapple and John Legend. It's all just ahead on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Families belong together. What about kids with parents behind bars? While people have been outraged, and rightly so, over family separation at the border, family separation is nothing new in the United States. According to the Sentencing Project, approximately 10 million children have experienced parental incarceration at some point in their lives. And like the prison population, black families are disproportionately represented. So without shedding differences, how can we come together to make real systemic change? I'm joined by two guests. Imani Davis has been advocating for children and families affected by incarceration for over 25 years. Her own father spent much of her life behind bars. And we're happy to welcome back Rashad Robinson. Rashad is the president of Color of Change and has been a leading voice on both immigration and the criminal justice system, as well as other systemic injustices in the U.S. of A. Thank you both for coming in. I'm really so happy to have you. Um, let's start with the personal. Um, Imani, watching this story play out at the border, just tell us, give us a little insight into how you react to this. Well, it was funny when we talked about me coming on the show, I, I was thinking about the fact that I've been watching the news with a box of tissues and a notebook. Um, because I think that I was looking for language and for evidence that would support the conversations we've been having around parental separation due to incarceration for the past 25 years. Yeah. Like, I came into that work in 1992. I was 14. Um, my father went to prison when I was six. And for me, I was, even though it is so incredibly difficult to watch what is physically happening, I mean, just, I don't even have the words when you're watching. Families um, being separated families at the being, border. Yes, absolutely. Um, babies being ripped from their mothers um, without any real plan. So part of me feel, felt a sense of gratitude, quite honestly, that when um, separation happens around incarceration, that very often, not all the time, but very often, children will be at least given to someone else that they know, yeah. and that there is some hope at some point that one would be returned. Not all the time, absolutely not, because we have horrible policies around child welfare, right? But. Um, I think what I was looking for was when I saw the American Pediatric Association come out, when I saw kind of all of these folks coming out saying these are the consequences of parental incarceration, I started saying, okay, are people paying attention? Because we've been saying this forever. Right. We've been saying forever that there are long-lasting, incredibly of detrimental of the separation, um, which I think when you criminalize people, you also criminalize their families, and that that is what we do in America. Um, and when you degradate people and act like they're not human beings, which is what we are now doing on the border, then I think we're, it's very easy for us to say, you know, these aren't normal families, these aren't natural families, they don't love the way we love. Um, I, think, I think that's what we're seeing, and I think that's the only way that anyone could actually even move like this. And, and to tell us just a little bit of what it was like for you, um, tell us, what was that like growing up at that early age with your dad? beyond where you could connect with him on a regular basis? I mean, my father was incarcerated in Virginia. We lived in New York, so it was a 10-plus hour trip um, that I feel tremendously grateful that I had a mom who was willing to make and also had grandparents who supported our capacity to make that trip. I think one of the things that most kids struggle with, I didn't struggle with, which was the financial implications of actually being able to get to families because so often they are hundreds and hundreds of miles away from where children live. Um, we were able to make that trip, so it was 25 full years of that trip. Um, I don't remember ever having a Father's Day not with him, but it is very different to do that in a prison visiting room. I think, you know, in hindsight, I look at it as I'm grateful that we were able to have physical contact as we become such a punitive nation, which is doing more and more and more to kind of dismantle contact visiting for children. Um, I feel grateful that we had that. But at the same time, I mean, what is it like? It's, I think the complexity is one that these children are gonna face, which is that you're, you're trying to understand 
the personal impact of just missing your parent and looking at it in the scale of like, this is my nation that has made a decision to destroy my family. Um, and I think that we don't think about that. I don't think that we think about how confusing that is for children to like, how do you then trust your police, trust your teachers, trust your, like, trust your community? Um, because, because your country has sunken its teeth into this insatiable need to destroy families. What about you, Rashad? I mean, you're so clear about the structural nature of all of this, but these are kids and we're watching them crying and this is a specific family or person. How do we hold those two realities at the same time? Well, we have to hold those two realities. I think what you said was so important because, you know, oftentimes people think of these, um, what they're seeing on TV, what they hear about in terms of families being ripped apart, whether it's by uh, mass incarceration, immigration policies, um, as unfortunate, almost like a car accident, right? As like a byproduct of these things. It's so sad. We should build empathy. Um, we should figure out what are the charitable things that we can put around it to kind of help these young people. I mean, and we're even seeing that in the idea that incarcerating the families together, together. would be better than would be separate. better, right? But if we don't move people from unfortunate to unjust, what we will end up is solutions that don't actually get us to solving anything, right? And when people stay in the unfortunate space, it's when you have big corporations that go into the inner city and they clean up schools instead of ending the inequality in public education. You have folks that work on reentry alone instead of actually ending mass incarceration with reentry being a, a kind of key component. There's these there's this way that we've got to move people to seeing the structural nature. Um, and how do we, um, in real ways, help people when they're seeing those stories, when they're seeing these images, not go into charity mind frame, but to go into structural reform mind frame. Because what we're seeing um, on the border what we are seeing in communities around the country has been manufactured by our leaders. Mm -hmm. It has been created by a set of decision makers who every single day wake up and have a choice about what they're going to do with our tax dollars, what they're going to do with their political power. And they have made a decision that the families that they're ripping apart are not valuable, mm -hmm. that they are not worthy, that voters will not care about them and they will not show up to the polls, that corporations are not nervous about disappointing them. And so we see big corporations making a lot of money off of detention, yeah. off of incarceration. We see media that tell pieces of the story, but not the full mm -hmm. story. It's why it's so important that we have independent media channels like yours. All of this um, is why we have to help people see these situations differently so we can approach them differently. Where do you see the connections in terms of the policy piece of this? I mean, I look at it at, at the arguments that the defenders of both mass incarceration and of our border policies make. And they say, well, we're sending a message policy. that we're you shouldn't to try to immigrate with America. your children. And if we, you know, frighten people enough, they won't come. We see the same kind of language around incarceration. We want to make incarceration not about correction, but about punishing so that it will be something that people, you know, don't break the rules. Is that the connection, this kind of punitive idea? I mean, I think that's just untrue, right? Like, I think that, that we've proven years and years and years ago that prison is not a deterrent to crime. And I think that we've also, like, that people are not paying attention to the fact that we've collapsed everyone at the border. So everybody is now an illegal just trying to come in. We are not having any conversations about asylum, about the fact that people are fleeing things, that, pe that why else would you fleeing. run across the border with your baby, right, unless you actually were trying to get away from something. So I think one thing is just that that narrative is just a lie. It's just a lie. Um, and I think that the conversation is humanity that that's what's missing. That's what people don't want to say, mm -hmm. right? Is that there's just a lack of humanity in all of it because we're not, we're not sending any message to anyone other than we are cruel and irresponsible and vicious and racist, and quite this, honestly. And this, and this gets us back to the unfortunate to unjust frame, right? Because we don't have the conversation about what people are freeing and what are the economic structures that have oftentimes been created by multinational yeah. corporations yeah. that have been created by 
um, American um, international um, impact on other communities, how that has actually created and, and um, helped to fuel some of the things that people are trying to escape, um, international war on drugs. And at the same time, in so many communities, it's easier to get a gun than it is to get a quality education, than it is to get mental health or health, any type of health care, than it is to get sort of a, a job. And so we have these manufactured problems in our communities, both here and abroad, that then um, they can, we can sort of build these punishment zones for people for their reaction to systems and structures that have been created. But make no mistake, if these folks were valuable, if black and brown people were valuable, you know, I live a stone's throw away between Columbia University and Central Harlem. No one cannot tell me that there's not just as much drugs being done on Columbia University's campus as there is in Central Harlem. But we know who's um, arrested. We know who's harassed. We know who's targeted. And that is not about, like, just issues of crime and punishment. That's issues of political, economic, and social power. Is there, though, a concrete connection? Like, is our carceral state, is the so-called criminal justice system that we have created connected to and fueling the <coughs> response to, you know, the way that we're addressing immigration as a society? Well, there's a couple of things right off the bat, that there's been um, deep um, investments of this current government um, in, in undoing some of the policies at the federal level that the Obama administration had put in around private prisons and private descent detention centers. And, and now the explosion of the stock prices yeah. for GEO, the private CCO, prison companies. The, these companies are now going to be making tons of money. The folks who provide the beds, the folks who provide the food, the folks who provide the health care, um, who are deeply connected to this administration yeah. at, all, at all levels. I want to uh, tease out this question of how do we get deeper in our analysis and, and instead of having warring kind of factions for attention. We've got the Muslim ban. We've got um, the separation policy. We've got mass incarceration. We've got Me Too. We've got Black Lives Matter. Like, sometimes it can feel like overwhelm, and it can also sort of feel like a smorgasbord, and how do I pick? What you're all saying is it's not about picking. It's about a root cause. Talk about that root cause, and how do we address it? Are we talking about, is it as simple as abolition? Not that that's simple. I mean, I'm not an abolitionist when it comes to prison, um, because I've been working inside of prison since I was 18 years old. I just turned 40. Um, I said that on television. It's good. It's all good. You're, you're coming um, to your prime. I am. I am. Um, and I, I would say that I'm, I met people inside that really needed yeah. to be there, like, at least for some period of time, yeah. right? That, so I'm not an abolitionist. I do think that we hold people way too long. Um, I do think that we disproportionately incarcerate based on race, class, access to services and resources. Money. Money, absolutely. Um, so that's not my perspective. You know, for me, I really, when I look at this, I actually look at it holistically, right? So what I see when I see all of these things coming up is I see profoundly harmed human beings. Yeah. Profoundly harmed. And that really is the conversation I'm always in, right? Which is that when I look at America, it's very easy for us to be enraged. I feel sad when I look at this, because the fact that people are not doing better, cannot do better, to me is really a very loud indicator of how profoundly harmed we are as a nation. And one of the reasons why I think that we are that way is because we don't tell the truth. You know, the reason why people are quick to say this thing about we've always done this, right? The Native American, the, the, um, the American Indian Welfare Act, and right, the separation of those families, um, the Japanese, right? indigenous forever all over the planet, but in America in particular, chattel slavery, yeah. right? The separation of families. Um, why it's important to say what we've done is so that we can acknowledge the harm we've caused and heal, right? I don't spend a lot of time trying to convince the Donald Trumps of the world that they should care about these little migrant babies. That's not what I'm worried about. But there's a huge fraction of America that just doesn't know what to think or what to do. Yes. Um, and I think that for them, what's really important is to continue to do this piece around having people understand that these aren't different families. To me, that's why I, that's why over these years, I've been willing to come out and say, I'm a child of a prisoner. These are the things you need to know about us. I don't sit up here, I don't cry, I don't do a huge production about being a victim. That's not what it is. I don't think that's empowering 
empowering for people. I think people need to hear that there is the capacity to thrive and survive very difficult circumstances. And in Virginia, families are allowed to go and plead the case. So I did. Everybody thought I was the most compelling person. So as a child, I was going in and sitting in front of the parole board and asking for my father's release year after year after year. Absolutely. Um, and it does tremendous damage, right? I remember not being able to get out of the bed for two days after that. It just takes everything you have. But I think that that's why it's important to be having the conversations that we're having, and I try to have them as often as possible. Because if somebody's willing to sit down with me or willing to sit down with you, it's an opportunity mm -hmm. to then humanize the things that are happening. I think that's the only way you turn a nation, quite honestly, is that you stop, you stop this narrative, narrative as if these are different kinds of people coming here to do crimes and coming here. No, no mother is coming across this border with her baby breastfeeding because she's trying to go and rob somebody of something. It's just a lie, and we have to continue to be pushing on people to tell the truth. So what do we do? I mean, there are campaigns around the bail bond system. Mm -hmm. There are campaigns around uh, incarceration and around the separation. But where do we begin? I think that um, we've gotten here over time at each of these big moments because we oftentimes let enablers off the hook. The institutions that occupy the sort of mainstream, and while the evildoers, whether they be Trump or someone else, is doing what they're doing. There are a whole host of institutions that hold them up. Yeah. And, you know, we really do try to focus in on the enablers. You know, we're not running our campaigns at the local bail bond industry, running our campaigns at the big insurance companies that say that they, like, make most of their money from, you know, insuring your home, like bankers, when in fact, the biggest piece of their business actually comes from backing the bail bonds, local bail bonds industry, you know, to the tune of billions of dollars. And it's nowhere to be found on their website. We um, run our campaigns, you know, not at Donald Trump around this, but about, you know, demanding that Microsoft no longer make um, uh, a whole set of um, cloud um, software for ICE, or that Greyhound no longer lets ICE agents without a warrant onto their buses because we've seen that they've done all sorts of things like, you know, lock up a Jamaican grandmother for three days who was on, you know, a legitimate visa um, because um, she didn't have her paperwork with her. Um, in that moment and didn't give her the access to call her, her family. We've um, seen them racially profile people time in and time out. And so if major corporations, if politicians that want to occupy the mainstream, if media outlets that expect us to tune in are all complicit in this and we're not holding them accountable, why do we think that, you know, the political leaders who are benefiting and are leading on these type of demands are going to do anything. And so for us, we do think that the time is now that we make people pick a side. What are you going to do in this moment? What will history say about you 5, 10, 15 years from now? Will they say that in this era you just wanted to make more money? That you just wanted to like, you know, add to your like already swelled retirement? Or did you stand up, push back, and make yourself uncomfortable because justice was more important? Imani, you want to add? I mean, I think part of what you were asking was like, kind of which thing does one focus on? Kind of, is, is there one yeah. area? And one of the things, being a movement baby, I always say I, I definitely grew up in the movement, right? Um, and your dad was a Panther. My dad was the Minister of Defense for the Black Panther Party inside, was an Attica, absolutely. Um, and one of the things that, that he actually taught us was like, the person who brings the water is just as valuable as the person who's doing any of the other demonstration acts, right? The, the women who stayed home and took care of kids are as valuable as, um, and that was really, one of the things, as I got into my activism in college, you know, and I was always like, well, I want to be doing this, and they're not letting me do this, and if I'm not, you know, and he was kind of ha needed me to really understand that there were so many ways to do this work. And so I think that, you know, looking at bail reform is important, looking at sentencing is important, looking at um, proximity, right? Like there's, in, in New York alone, there are, there are new things on the books that we're looking at, right? That judges would take, in, that, that correction institutions, correctional institutions would take into account when, when placing parents in prison, when they're going to send them somewhere, right? To send them someplace that's closer to home, right? Or having in the pretrial 
sentencing reports having a family impact statement, right, where people would start to think about the impact of incarceration, taking children into account for custodial and non-custodial parents. Um, so there are things, to me, it's all of it, you know, and I think that one of the reasons why I actually stepped away from this field and took a break was that I got very tired of people wanting to say that there was only one right way mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. I think that everybody needs to be doing it all the time. Part of why I started an actual for-profit business was because I understood that unless you were actually coming in and making financial impacts, nobody cares. Yeah. Nobody cares. I mean, big, the big folks don't care. Like, unless you're actually, you know, when, when the election was happening and we were, there was all this press about who was buying who in terms of the senators, I looked at my business partner, I said, it only cost $100,000 to get Mike Rubio or whatever that was. Like, that's all she gave? DeVos, right, yeah. when she was up. That's, that's all cost. that cost? To me, it was like, that's all that cost? We're doing this all wrong, right? So, um, <laughs> so for me, it was, it, it was looking at the fact, I think it's everything, and I think that he's exactly right. I think continuing to put pressure on folks to not do business as usual, to be watching very carefully the privatization of, parents, of, of prisons, because that is where the most harm is coming. We can't regulate those. They're not by the state. We can't, we have no, we have no control over what's happening in those prisons. Those prisons don't have to have visiting ever. They can do a complete televisiting. They don't have to give people access to their families. They don't even have to ha not have non-solitary confined spaces. Like it's, it's actually quite terrifying to think that we've privatized this as if it's a farm of animals. Which is what we're gonna be doing on this immigration side. That's exactly which, what we're gonna be doing. Unless we stop it. Well, with people like you, maybe we will stop it. I thank you both so much for coming and having this conversation. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. You can get more information at our website. Khalif Browder was 16 years old when he was accused of stealing a backpack by a man who changed his story several times. Khalif spent three years in jail, 80% of that time in solitary confinement. He received regular beatings by corrections officers. Eventually, he committed suicide. Khalif was never convicted of a crime. He always said he was innocent, even when pressured to take a plea deal to get out early. And after three years, the district attorney's office dismissed the charges when it became clear they had no case. So how did this happen? How did a 16-year-old boy convicted of no crime spend three years in jail? It all started because prosecutors demanded a teenager accused of petty theft pay $3,000 in bail. Knowing it would pull him out of his young life trap him in jail, even force him to plead guilty despite his claim of innocence. They demanded totally unnecessary and out of reach bail from young Khalif, jailing him. Khalif's story is not just tragic, it's an outrageous injustice. And there are far too many other stories of injustice like this around the nation. Hundreds of thousands are pulled out of school, pulled out of their jobs, pulled out of church, pulled out of their families and communities, trapped in an oppressive and racist criminal justice system by prosecutors, judges, bail bondsmen, and everyone else who profits from it. Mass incarceration, the United States imprisoning more people than any country on earth, it starts with money bail. District attorneys demand bail amounts they know are too high, which either keep people stuck in jail or force people to take unjust plea bargains and get stuck in prison, falsely driving up convictions so they can look tough, even though it has nothing to do with public safety or driving down crime. They use mass incarceration to build their careers. As mass incarceration expanded and the bail industry's influence has grown, the bail bonds industry has become a lot like the payday loan industry. It's built on predatory business practices, preying on black people and poor communities of color whom the criminal justice system disproportionately targets. The money bail industry transfers huge amounts of money from everyday people to large corporations. Insurance corporations use bail to profit from taking away people's freedom. They trap people in debt while bail bondsmen invade their lives. And they take people's money with no recourse to get it back. The bail industry also pays off politicians to block reform and keep the system rigged and racist for profit. In America, you're better off being guilty and rich than innocent and poor. Bail is the punishment you get whether or not you are guilty of the crime. While many white people charged with crimes largely spend the time before their trial free, district attorneys and judges have different rules for black people, for poor people, demanding bail in the first place, setting it far out of reach financially, threatening them with long sentences if they don't take a plea. It's either bail that is way too big for the crimes they're charged for, or charges that are way too big for the evidence against them. Either way, they trap people in jail, in debt, or with lifelong criminal records. It's your punishment for being black and poor, which has nothing to do with any real crime. 
Between 1990 and 2009, the percentage of people charged with felonies rose, and those who were required to pay money bail for their release increased by 65%. By design, the number of people jailed without even being convicted skyrocketed. These are people who deserve to be free, but have had their lives ruined by jail, even when their cases were dismissed or they won. Many spend more time in jail pre-trial than they would have spent in prison had they been convicted for the original charges. Police and prosecutors booked people in local and county jails 10.9 million times in 2015. How do we know it's a trap? Because 90% of the people in jail awaiting an end to felony cases are there even though some amount of bail was set for them. But bail was set so they couldn't pay it, just like for Khalif. There is no legitimate public safety reason to allow these abuses to continue. There is no reason to lock people up simply because prosecutors are allowed to set bail too high. In fact, there is no real reason for money bail at all. The bail corporations and district attorneys in our criminal justice system have been winning and profiting, defending this injustice. But in the years ahead, we intend to change that story. We're going to win. Our communities are going to win. Our families are going to win. Justice is going to win. To be part of ending money bail and the racism in our criminal justice system, go to colorofchange.org slash bail.